Good evening. It's good to see you here. Tonight we're continuing our Wednesday summer series on the women who fear God. Our guest speaker is David Deffenbaugh. Uh, I couldn't tell you much about David that you don't already know. Uh, I got some numbers from him. He spent, grew up at Hillcrest and spent a total of 19 years here. He's been preaching for 35 years. Right now uh, he's a minister at Center Hill Church of Christ in Paragold, Arkansas. Uh, in total, he's been working there four and a half years and working in his current position for about two and a half years. So we're really happy he's here uh, talking about Mary Magdalene, and I won't waste any more of your time. We'll go ahead and turn it over to David. Thank you, Caleb. I feel a rather heightened sense of privilege to be in this place and to speak on this occasion about a woman who feared God whose name was Mary. Now in, in Caleb's correspondence with me and I know with other speakers in this series, he's indicated that the the underpinning, the basis for this series comes from Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And so we too ascribe praise to all women who fear the Lord. We know very unfortunately that we live in a culture and in a time when many women have achieved a level of name recognition for a wide variety of reasons. <clears throat> many of them for their beauty and unfortunately for their willingness to display that in ways that are less than appropriate. But others for their talents and their skills for their notoriety derived from wealth and achievement and positions of power, and oftentimes behaviors that capture the attention and eyes of this rather lurid culture that we live in. But other women have gained name recognition with the sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, holy and righteous, and every one of these are women who fear the Lord. These women God praises, and these women God calls upon every one of us to praise as well. And one such woman who fits that category is the woman that is under consideration this evening, whose name is Mary. Now, I noticed on your schedule, this is the third week in a row that you have considered at least one woman named Mary. And so some measure of distinction is necessary for us tonight. We have a variety of ways, even in our culture and our time, that we will make distinctions of people who have the same name. Now, for us, we usually just use a last name, and uh, that works most of the time. It worked in our family marvelously until our, our son Dalton married a sweet girl named Mary. So you've got two Mary Deffenbaughs. Not a big problem until it comes to Christmas time, and then you've got to start designating. Do you go Big Mary, Little Mary? Ooh, that's a little dicey. Uh, how about old Mary, young Mary? That one's not too good either. So you work those kind of things out. The way they did this in biblical times was there was a variety of ways, and one of the ways they would do that would be to <clears throat> would be to identify the person by their parent. And so that's why you run across so many names in the New Testament that start with Bar. Bar Jonah. Bartholomew, Bartimaeus, that bar means the son of. Now, having spent some time in Eastern Europe uh, over a number of years, I, I have a friend there 
well, she no longer lives there, and, and her name was Yelena. Now, we anglicized that to Helen, but her peers, her fellow countrymen, knew her as uh, Yelena Mikhailovna, that is, Helen, the daughter of Michael. So, you know, what Caleb could have done tonight was had been to have introduced me as David Donaldovich, David, the son of Donald. But that, that wouldn't have meant much of anything to anybody, I don't think. But that's one of the ways they did it in the Bible, the son of. Or sometimes they would do it by where you were from, your hometown. Now the most famous example of that in Scripture, or maybe we should say infamous example of that in Scripture, is a fellow by the name of Judas. Several Judases in Scripture, but only one of them hailed from the village of Kirioth. Or, to shorten that, it was Judas Iscariot. And so it is with our woman tonight, our Mary tonight. She is known for the town from which she hailed. The Galilean coastal community of Magdala. Mary of Magdala, or as we know her, Mary Magdalene. Now... Her hometown was rather unremarkable, and so it's really not her hometown that distinguishes her to us. But rather, it is the life that this Mary lived. But even that, though, is saying a little more than we can say tonight because we so know so little of the life that she lived. What we know about Mary primarily is concentrated over a period of about 60 hours that spanned over three days relative to three events in the life of Jesus that happened in immediate succession of each other. But those events, we know of none other more important than those three. It was our Savior's death, burial, and resurrection. And it just so happened that what we know about our Mary tonight all happened in regard to those same three events. Or you can think about it like this. The brightest light of Scripture is shined upon that portion of Jesus' life. Everything before, even all the way back into the Old Testament, everything before points to and everything after flows from. And it's in that same spot that Mary appears. Make no mistake about it. God has every intention that you and I see this woman. Now, it is true that there are a couple of other insights into this Mary that we know about prior to this, and that's actually where I want us to start tonight. And so you go to Luke chapter 8, and is our first introduction to Mary Magdalene. And what's happening here is Luke is telling us about a group of women who were followers of Jesus which we, we know that to be the case. There were many women who followed Jesus, but it goes a bit further than that. When you think about Jesus in his ministry traveling about Galilee and Judea and over into Perea and Samaria, uh, what, what, com what picture comes to your mind? A group of 13 men walking around everywhere they went? Well, that's not right. Well, yeah, there were 13 men. There were 12 apostles and there were Jesus, but that wasn't all of them. The group was larger than that. Do you remember in Acts 1 when it comes time to select a replacement for Judas Iscariot who has killed himself? And they look among themselves and they try to find those men who might be qualified to fill that position. And they said, well... At the very least, they have to be individuals who, who were walked in and out among us with Jesus from John the Baptist, the baptism of John, up until the crucifixion. 
Now, we don't know how many there were to select from, but there were a number of them, and they came up with two names that they remember they presented, which tells us, among other things, that there was a larger group than 13 men who were traveling about Palestine. Not only that, from Luke we learned there were a number of women traveling with them as well. That might alter our picture of what we think of when we think of Jesus in his travels. But Luke goes so far as to name several of these women. And one of those he names is Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene. And what is more, that Mary and some of these other women were women of means. They had finances at their disposal. And they used those to become benefactors of the ministry of Jesus. What's more than that, it also says, and please don't miss this, that they were ministering to him. Wait a minute. I thought Jesus said that he came to minister, not to be ministered to. Well, that's true. That's very true. But that doesn't mean Jesus was not ministered to, and he was. And Mary was one of those women who ministered to Jesus. Now it's also here that we learn this other thing about Mary that I think is so important, and that is that Mary was one from whom Jesus had cast out seven evil spirits, seven demons. That's all we're told about that. We don't know for how long she had been possessed of these demons. We don't know when it began. We only know when it ended, and that's when Jesus cast them out. And we don't even know how that manifested itself in Mary. But think for a moment. We know how it was that that phenomenon was manifested in the lives of a lot of people. And it's not a pretty picture, is it? I think we can know for certain that Mary, up until she met Jesus for the first time, lived a torturous life. Think about it. That those possessed of demons, among other things, were ones who demonstrated very, we could say at the least, very antisocial behavior. They were ones who at times were violent. They were ones who participated in activities that were injurious to others. They were ones who at times went about wearing no clothes. They behaved themselves in ways that made it impossible for them to carry on normal interpersonal relationships with other people. They could physically overwhelm other people. They were ones who at times participated in self-destructive behaviors, throwing themselves into the fire, cutting themselves, doing things to hurt themselves. They were in bodies that had been embodied by evil spirits and controlled to the point that they had become instruments of the demonic. Even to the point of speaking their own voice, but for a demon. That's scary stuff. And though we may not know, we do not know particularly and specifically how it was manifested in the life of Mary, make no mistake about it, she lived a tortured life until until she encountered Jesus of Nazareth. And for whatever reason, we don't know the reason, For whatever reason, Jesus chose that this woman would be freed 
from that demon possession. Her life would be restored, her life would be healed, her life would be redeemed, and she would no longer be imprisoned at the hands of Satan. Her life forever changed. And not just because Jesus cast those demons out of her, but because of how she chose to respond to that. And that was that for the rest of her life, she would fully and completely devote herself to ministering to her new Master, her Lord, Jesus. And so it is that when Jesus, by his very own deliberate choice and plan, made his way to Jerusalem for the last time, that there accompanied him a number of people, and among them were these women, some of these women of Galilee. And so they came with Jesus. And when everything played out that was to play out, that Jesus knew was going to happen ahead of time to him at Jerusalem, and he was taken by the hands of wicked men and nailed to a cross that standing there was Mary. And when you think about Mary as well as some other of these women at the cross, we need to appreciate courage, the bravery, the devotion of these women, because they were standing in the midst of, I don't know if we can use the word multitude or not, at least a very large crowd of people who were with one voice spewing their anger, their hatred, their vitriol at this troublesome rabbi from Nazareth. They were nothing short of a bloodthirsty mob. And all of it was aimed at this man on a cross. And Mary, without fear, and without shame, took her stand with Jesus. And her standing there with these other women is also notable not only for that, but it is also notable for who was not there. For the night before, Jesus had sat at table with his apostles. And though they professed their devotion to Jesus, Jesus knew better. We remember one in particular, Peter, who said, Oh Lord, no, uh-uh, I will never, ever desert you. And Jesus said, Yes, Peter, you will. As a matter of fact, you'll deny me three times. But to the others, he also said in John 16, 32, you will scatter and you will leave me all alone. And lo and behold, Jesus was right. The men scattered. The women stayed. And one of those women is Mary. 
and she watched as her Savior died. Just as scripture draws our attention, not just to the death of Jesus, but also his burial. And it's not our purpose tonight to to go through those events of Jesus on the cross, but focus our attention on Mary. And Jesus did indeed die on that cross. It's very interesting that Scripture portrays for us the fact that those who left the scene of the crucifixion left as different people than they were when they came. Now, you can't say that about everybody, but you can definitely say, about, say it about many of them. Because they came with hatred in their heart. They came demanding, crucify him. And they got what they expected, but they also got more than they expected. Because what they got was witnessing a man who quietly, mutely, and resolutely received the gross injustice that was directed at him. They saw as the sun quit shining. There's there's no other way to describe it. At the very time of day when it was at its highest and its brightest, it was not an eclipse. It was not heavily overcast sky. Luke says the sun failed to shine. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. Something is going on here. And I think we find it expressed for one in the centurion, the grizzled soldier, professional executioner, upon seeing how this man died. Exclaimed, truly, this is the Son of God. Now I know, I know, I know that that statement, as it appears, could be translated a little differently, that he said, truly this was a son of a God. But Mark, where that statement is recorded, Mark was not bearing witness, neither was Matthew, Luke, or John. They were not bearing witness to a son of a God. That's not what that man said. Truly, this Son of God. And not only that, Luke tells us that as this crowd of people who had come to witness this spectacle left the scene, they departed beating their breast. Albert Barnes says that this is a token of alarm and fear and anger. What has just happened here? And it's these same people, seven weeks later, who would have been in Jerusalem and heard Peter and the other apostles stand and proclaim this Jesus whom you have crucified. God has made him both Lord Christ. Their hearts were cut on that day, and they were being prepared on this day. Something changed dramatically for them, but it didn't change for Mary, because Mary came to stand with Jesus. She came to minister to Jesus. She came in support of Jesus. And what she did in his life, she was going to continue to do in his death. 
And so she watched as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, with permission of the king, removed his body from the cross. Now just think about that for a moment. That's no small feat in itself. But they did. It's very possible that Mary and the other woman who watched with her this removal of Christ and and his being prepared for burial may have had some suspicion, I don't know, of these two men because they are identified as being secret disciples. Mary was anything but a secret disciple. But nevertheless, they watched. His body was cleaned, wrapped in linen cloth with 75 pounds of nard inserted in the wrapping and carried a short distance to a nearby garden and placed in a new tomb, a newly hewn out tomb. And then they also watched as a very large stone was rolled over that entrance. She watched because she knew she was coming back here. But as the sun set on that Friday night, the Sabbath was dawning, and so no more could be done. And though the Sabbath was a day of rest, her mind was not resting because she was thinking the whole time about her plans to return. Her and the other ladies and what they would do when they came back. Now, I I don't know what it was exactly that was on their minds, but... I have grown suspicious in my life that sometimes when women watch men do a task, they, they are thinking that maybe the men are not doing it as well as it should have been done. I don't know. Maybe. And maybe they thought that Jesus' body had not been handled the way they would have handled it and treated the way they would have treated it. But whatever it was, in the pre-dawn hour, on the first day of the week, those women met at a predetermined spot. They brought with them the supplies that they had gathered, and they began to make their way on the short trip to the tomb. And they began to discuss what was on all of their minds. You know, there's a really big stone covering that tomb. And we don't know how we're going to get in there. They had a problem. They knew they had a problem. They had a problem that they didn't know about, too. Because you remember the Jews were fearful of the disciples coming and taking the body of Jesus because they remembered what Jesus said was going to happen on the third day. And they didn't want them pulling any shenanigans here. So there was a guard set and the tomb was sealed. Now, these women had no way of knowing that. They had no way of knowing that there had been official measures taken to prevent the very thing that they wanted to do. And that was to get their hands on the body of Jesus. But when they arrived, It's not anything like they anticipated it would be. Because when they got there, the stone was gone. It was rolled away. The tomb was open. And there was what the text says, a young man was standing there. And he told the the women, the, the tomb is empty. He is not here. He has risen. Go tell the disciples. And so, these women are charged as the first evangelists. You know, an evangelist is a proclaimer of good news. And they've been given the good news that the tomb is empty, that he is risen. And they are the first to be given that message to deliver to others. And so they do. Now, I have to confess, 
it has to be confessed that tracing the steps of Mary on this day is challenging because she is going to wind up back at the tomb by herself. And she's standing there weeping. And she is trying to figure out in her own mind how to make sense of what she has been told and what she sees, that the body of Jesus is gone. And she's doing the best she can with that. And as she is weeping, she stoops to look into the tomb, and there she sees two angels. Woman, why are you weeping? She says, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, she's already been told that he's risen. She's not quite sure what to make of that, obviously. And she's making the best sense of this that she can. And in her mind, it must be that they've just moved the body of Jesus. And she turns and sees a man standing there, which she would very naturally, I guess, supposed to be the gardener. And he speaks to her and says, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she says to the supposed gardener, If you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and and I'll, I'll take care of him. I'll take him. And apparently she has turned again. And she said, and he says, Mary. And it is a moment of recognition. And she suddenly turns again and cries out, Teacher! Only she spoke in the Aramaic. Rabbani! She knows it is Jesus. And she either embraces him or falls at his feet and clings to his feet. But he says to her, Do not cling to me. I am ascending to my father. Go tell my brothers. And so Mary went. And she joyously announces to them, I have seen him. Mary, the very first eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. This woman, this woman, chosen by God with the singular honor of being the first. When we think about the life of Mary and what we know of that life, there are, I I suppose, a number of takeaways. One that certainly comes to my mind is the fact that Mary chose for her identity to be in Jesus. That's what she was. This is who I am. I am a follower of Jesus. And this is a woman who had a horrid past. This is a woman who had suffered greatly, unfairly, unjustly. She chose that her identity would be her new life in Christ. Not what had been bad or wrong with the past, but what she was now anew in Jesus. People choose a lot of things 
for their identity. This is who I am. And some people choose things like their achievements, the status they have attained in their life, their, their bank account, their career, their whatever. This is who I am. But so few people make the choice of making their identity. This is who I am. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. But Mary, she chose to be that. But not only that, Mary served. It is a striking thing that she is described as one who ministered to Jesus. She ministered to him in his ministry, Luke chapter 8. But you look at the description of her at the cross, it, it, it says she was there to minister to him. How do you do that? How do you minister to someone who's hanging on a cross? How do you minister to someone who is the object of such hatred and anger and violence? How much can you do? Well, quite frankly, not much. But she did what she could. She knew that her master had said, I am among you as one who serves. I came not to be served, but to serve. The Bible talks about <clears throat> our being formed. It talks about how we can be formed by the Word. What is the influence that actually shapes you and forms you into what you are? And our world forms people. It shapes people. It makes people into something. And what our world is making people into are ones who expect to be served. I want what I want. I want it the way I want it, and I want it when I want it. And that when, by the way, is right now. And our world's pretty effective of making those kinds of people. The scripture also talks about those who are not, to use the words of Paul from Romans 12, conformed to the world, but rather transformed. That I am formed by Christ. And you know what those being formed by Christ are? They are servants. I am among you as one who serves. And yet we know, we know, Many times when people walk in those doors, not just those doors, but the doors of any church, anywhere, are there with the spirit and the attitude that has been formed by the world that has saying, okay, so what do you have to offer me? What can you do for me? How can you serve me? For Mary, it was always, how can I serve Jesus? Mary is one upon whom God intends for us to cast our eyes. Because the record that he chose to be places her or makes her visible to us at the times when Scripture's light is shining the brightest. And there she is, Mary of Magdala.